Okay. Well, hello, my beautiful friends. Welcome to In Bed with Rebecca, my semi-monthly podcast on life, love, sex, and consciousness. And um, I, I am dialing in from my luxuriant bedroom in Lutz, Florida. Uh, for those of you who know me, I live in a nudist resort, but thanks to Facebook, can't be naked. Um, I'm really excited to have my guest today, Leon Feingold, calling in from his bed in Brooklyn, New York. New York City, Hell's Kitchen, the center of the universe. Sorry, Florida. Ah, uh, okay. Yes. Uh, well, as a former New Yorker, so I'll just tell you a little bit about how I found Leon, is that his last name is the same as my maiden name which is just kind of an interesting coincidence. So, um, Leon, you kind of came to my attention because I found your YouTube video. You were a TEDx speaker on the topic of polyamory. Um, how did you get that gig? So I've been active in the poly community here in New York uh, for over 10 years. And I'm also active in several other organizations, one of which is Mensa, the International High IQ Society. And one of my Mensa friends said she was thinking about starting a, uh, a TEDx, which is basically TED Talks, but uh, elsewhere around the globe. And she wanted to start one where she lived in Bushwick, which was also a uh, very avant-garde. Polly was kind of particularly popular there. And she said, you know what? This would be a great opportunity for you to tell the world all the things that you've been telling me about polyamory. And uh, she asked me to try out um, the process as you do a three minute video on the subject you'd like to speak about, technically about what you'd like to speak, but whatever. And um, they liked it enough to offer me a full TED talk. There's mini TED talks, which are up to about six minutes. And then there's full TED talks, which are up to about 18 minutes. And I was given a full TED talk. Uh, they gave me a training, uh, a couple of training professionals. We had a bunch of meetings to, to flesh out and streamline our talks. It was actually a fascinating experience. Um, and then I gave what to this point in my life is one of the proudest moments of my life, delivering a TED Talk on polyamory. And as far as I can tell, it was really, really well received. Thank you. Yeah, so just on YouTube, put in Leon's name and that'll pop up. And this might be the most important question I ask you in the whole talk, at least for me personally, is Mensa a good place to meet lovers? Because I've been thinking about joining. Yes. Yeah. I'm going to tell you a really quick story. Um, the reason I joined Mensa, I was qualified for it since I was a kid, but uh, I went to one event and it didn't really appeal to me. I was easily the youngest person there by a generation and a half. And uh, the conversations were interesting, but the people, it, it just didn't appeal to me. Um, and then this is when I was in high school. And then when I went to college, uh, after my mother had, this is a true story, after my mother had met maybe three or four of the, the people that I've been dating, she pulled me aside at some point. She said, listen, don't you ever want to meet a smart person, like someone who can keep up with you? I said, well, you know, this is, you know, I'm just, I'm just having fun. I'm just dating. And I, I don't know where any of these are going to go. She's like, listen, Leon, you need someone that can keep up with you. Why don't you try Mensa again? I was like, all right, fine. So uh, by that point, I went to, instead of Long Island, I went to a Manhattan Mensa event. And that was much more my style. And I've been active ever since. And that was many years ago. Yeah, I, I hear you. I definitely am interested in meeting someone that can keep up with me. And even though I qualified, never quite interested. And, um, you know, actually, that strikes me as a good segue, because a lot of people think it's hard enough to meet one person that I connect with. If you're poly, how do you meet several? I think if you have a more traditional mindset, what you're looking for is somebody who is everything. Or at least the expectation is that if you're not dating someone who could be your everything, you're wasting your time. The poly mindset looks at it very differently. It says, well, you know, look at the connections that you can make. Because just like the sitcoms say, if you give someone a chance, you can you can fall for almost anyone. Uh, you just have to give them the chance. We don't allow ourselves to develop the connections that might organically grow between any two people over anything that we share in common. It could be a physical connection, could be an intellectual uh, connection. Uh, it could we, we could just love going to opera together. We could both have an interest in baseball. I mean, the idea that one partner needs to meet every need and want we have is silly to me when I finally thought about it. But 
because I was raised in a traditional mindset, it never occurred to me. I just thought I hadn't met the right one. For me. But the cool thing about polyamory is it encourages people to connect in whatever ways make sense. And if you match over one or two or five levels, you can do that without trying to force them into something that maybe they're not cut out to be or vice versa, since you need to match them just like they need to match you. Mm hmm. Yeah. Awesome. So maybe for some people who aren't I, tr aren't familiar with what polyamory means, and I think a lot of them, they think it's polygamy, many husband, many wives, um, or it's just an excuse to have more sex. So uh, could you maybe answer to speak to that a little bit about, I mean, I think you already have really, but why choose polyamory? Maybe that's a. Well, I, I actually consider polyamory an orientation. Um, mm -hmm. You may be attracted to relationships with people of the same sex under which situation you'd be identified as homosexual. You may be attracted to people of, of a different sex, in which case you may identify as heterosexual. Uh, you may not find anyone uh, attractive. You may not, that part of your brain may not be active right now. You may identify as asexual. I mean, there's a lot of different orientations that people might have regarding the people to whom they're attracted. To me, polyamory is an orientation which defines the kind of relationships that attract you. If you are the kind of person that is attracted to a relationship with one person at a time and that works for you and for your partners, then I think polyamory wouldn't necessarily make sense to pursue unless it's just uh, to learn more, which I always think is a great reason to, to learn, to have experience with. But to me, since I define polyamory as um, the, the concept or lifestyle or mindset of having multiple meaningful relationships at the same time, regardless of whether they have sex or not, regardless of whether they have any specific requirement other than open and honest communication. Um, in that context, I really like the idea of identifying as polyamorous because that way when I meet somebody, I can connect with them on any way that makes sense uh, if we do. So mm -hmm. to me, I think it becomes much less threatening. Uh, a lot of people think, as you pointed out, about polygamy, uh, polyandry, uh, usually, uh, or polygyny, actually. Uh, polyandry is multiple multiple men and one woman. Uh, polygyny is the way it's traditionally been, which is one man and, and multiple women, uh, simply because men have always controlled the means of production. They, they've always controlled, they've always had the power in society. So uh, but that, that's another sociological tangent. Um, I think if somebody is interested in developing meaningful connections and that speaks to them, if they like the idea of exploring multiple meaningful connections uh, without cheating, without violating any any agreements or rules, without without being dishonest in any way, but they just genuinely love the idea of connecting with people authentically then I would absolutely recommend exploring polyamory. Thank you. you said like a million things that I want to talk about now. So <laughs> I'm a little ADD, a little OCD. I, I got it all going on. So um, I'm already in bed. So you've got me for a while. Oh, awesome. <laughs> um, that's the best offer I've had in a while. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so you, you said you compared polyamory to heterosexuality, homosexuality, which I think of as more sort of hardwired there and, and not even necessarily because I feel I've seen people once they give themselves permission, actually acknowledge that they are attracted to more of this, more sex with different, different kinds of sex with different bodied people than they may have let on. But are you saying that you don't think someone can become polyamorous or learn to enjoy polyamory if they've always thought of themselves as monogamous? No, on the contrary, I think just similar to orientation of attraction, uh, like, like sexual attraction of a person, I think orientation attraction, uh, you may have an innate preference for one or the other, but of course anyone can uh, decide that they like um, you know, a, a different one than the one that they thought they were in. The key is whether with the one that they thought they that that was naturally them was in fact naturally them, or whether it was really just what they've been socialized. I think one of the biggest lessons that I have to share is to what extent we are heavily socialized 
with all of our orientations. And I think the key is authenticity, figuring out what is important to us and why. Why is super crucial. And then finding ways to explore whether, you know, like a scientist testing things and testing theories and saying, well, maybe I do like this. How do I know if I don't try? The reason we don't do many of those things is because we're so socialized against it. The lessons of, you know, what it means to be gay, what it means to be, you know, uh, to, to, to make out or to be attracted to someone of our own gender, especially as children, we are very strongly warned against. So even if we had natural inclinations to explore that, most children, when we are at our most impressionable, are it is drilled into us to behave a certain way, act a certain way, fit in rather than stand out. Because nothing's worse as a kid than being bullied or teased because you don't fit in. And the best way to avoid that, of course, is to fit in, whether or not that's natural. So while people may feel that they are heterosexual, uh, cisgender, um, male, um, you know, uh, monogamous, polyamorous, whatever, whatever, however they identify, very few criteria by which we identify are in fact not changeable. For example, I identified my whole life as heterosexual, but there's really nothing stopping me from exploring a same-sex experience except me. And the only reason I hadn't growing up was because I was socialized against it. Like why, you know, what did it mean if I wanted to make out and to kiss a guy, what would that mean about me? Would, would that mean that I wasn't, you know, popular? Would it mean that I wasn't uh, strong or, or macho or attractive to women or whatever? Like all these little voices inside of our head that a lifetime of socialization drills into us. I think we would genuinely be much happier if we separated the outside voices from our authentic inside voices. So that's one of the things that I would encourage people to pursue. And if it turns out that the inside voice says, yeah, I'd like to explore polyamory, then I would encourage learning more about it and exploring it. Awesome, you are preaching to the choir. So how did you give yourself the permission to let go of those socialized uh, beliefs that you were carrying? Well, it took time. Um, for example, I still have not had a full-on sexual experience with uh, another man. Um, I, at this point, I recognize the homophobic socialization that I've grown up with just as a normal, you know, middle-class suburban male. Um, and, and I know, and in fact, this is something which, which I've, like, I smiled when I recognized this. I am envious of people who are pansexual, bisexual, they can go out with whomever they want without having to worry about, well, okay, you know, what, what machinery does this person have? Like, what, what does it mean about me if I'm going to touch a person or kiss a person? Do I have to think like what they have below the belt or whatever? I mean, like that kind of roadblock mentally is so frustrating for me. Like I wish I didn't have that and it's taken time to recognize and overcome that. And at this point in my life, if, there were somebody that I was attracted to, regardless of gender, uh, I'd like to think that I would be much more open to pursuing anything, pursuing that person, exploring whatever makes sense. So I actually, I've another lesson that I've learned to teach myself is to try to take gender out of the equation mm -hmm. and just say, look, is this a situation? Is this a person that I could be attracted to? Am I happy with this? Do, how do I feel about this situation? And not worry so much about whether you know, anyone was born a certain gender or exhibits a certain way. I just look at situations. Did you have any similar obstacles in choosing a polyamorous lifestyle over monogamy? Or did you always think, you know, it really, it really makes sense that we can love more than one person. And I'm okay with expressing that in the culture. Yeah, uh, good question. I never knew that polyamory existed. Like, unfortunately, most people, maybe not watching this broadcast, but Unfortunately, most people are raised that monogamy and the, you know, prudish Victorian ideal of one man, one woman forever till death do you part. It's quaint and it works for some people, but most people don't recognize that there are other workable relationship structures that they can explore if they want to. I think if you don't know about it, 
it never occurs to you to explore it. So when I finally learned about polyamory, at least for me, it blew my mind and I wanted to learn as much as I could about it. I always felt there was something not right with monogamy because no matter how many people I met, and I met some wonderful, amazing people throughout my life and my dating experience, but none of them was everything I wanted. And I thought, well, that's going to change. That's just because I haven't met the right one for me. But as I said, my TED talk, it certainly wasn't for lack of looking. And I started getting like really insecure, like what was wrong with me? And I, I started to see a therapist to figure out whether there was in fact something wrong with me. Was I just too picky? Or was I not mature enough? Was I not looking for the right people? Was I not looking in the right places? And what I finally learned um, was that the idea of monogamy was not authentic for me. And when I finally learned that polyamory was a thing and that it worked, that just put everything together for me, like jigsaw puzzle pieces, it just clicked. And I was like, oh my God, I'm polyamorous. And from that point on, my life and my relationships actually simplified rather than getting more complicated. Mm-hmm, beautiful. One thing you said that I really resonate with is this idea of you can connect with people however you do. Um, and I guess one of my soapbox issues around polyamory is that most people value the partners that they mingle their genitals with more than other partners in their lives. And, or in their, so, you know, for me, I consider myself polyamory. I don't at this point have anyone that I mingle genitals with, but the people that I are in my life, I'll tell you that I have life partners. You know, they're the ones who are my, the executor on my will and the emergency contact on my medical forms. Um, you know, they're the people I call when everything is good, when I have something to celebrate. Um, and that relationship is as valid to me as people that I fuck. Of course it is. And that's why I think my view of polyamory makes the most sense, not just for me, but I think for other people. Polyamory to me is multiple meaningful relationships, regardless of sexual interaction. So if you have you know, the, the executors on your will and the people that you open your heart to, the people with whom you're vulnerable, the people with whom you develop meaningful relationships. I keep going back to that term because that just makes the most sense for me. Dex is actually a red herring most of the time. It only is, and sex is exactly and only as meaningful as the people having it decide that it does. So if two people see each other as potential life partners and this is the culmination of like a week's worth of flirting and, and, and getting to know each other. And now this is like the next step in their relationship. And, and it may transport them both to like the, this amazing place where they decide that, wow, this is what I've been looking for. And I'm going to build on this for the rest of my life. And that's great. And if the two people have been dating the entire time and they both say, you know what, this is just the natural progression of our friendship. It doesn't mean anything. But let's see how it goes. And maybe we'll, we'll, we'll add this to our Swiss Army knife of connection. Mm -hmm. And that's great. And both of those situations can result in a life partnership involving sex as long as they're both on the same page. The problem, of course, comes when two people have been dating and they go to bed together and one of them thinks, oh, my gosh, this is the next step to the rest of my life. This means that this is my romantic life partner, my twin flame, my pick a cliche. And the other one thinks, wow, this person's really sexy and hot. Let's see where this goes. But I also, you know, it, it's too early or whatever reason they have. I, maybe this person isn't even a potential life partner for me, but I don't need to think about that because we've only known each other for a week. So this is why open and honest communication is so important in all relationships, not just polyamorous ones. Mm -hmm. You need to make sure that you and whomever it is you're connecting with are on the same page you don't need to know what the future holds but you should know where you are in the present yeah well said i mean my my observation and my experience is that the, one of the challenges is in, in in any relationship is when you have different expectations or desires but in poly you know i had a partner that i thought was the be all end all but that wasn't the the role i filled for him in the polycule he had another partner that he thought was that and i was the sexy hot fun time and mm -hmm. and more of a meeting of the minds time and i caused everybody honestly a lot of pain in that relationship by trying to make it into what it wasn't mm. yeah so, that, that happens a lot unfortunately and we're we're raised 
speaking of socialization, we're raised not to really talk about these things. We, we just let things go. In fact, most people don't want to cause a problem. They don't want to rock the boat. If things feel good or, or, or are in line with what they are projecting, most people don't ask questions. They don't want to rock the boat. They don't want to change things. And I think that's a life lesson most people should learn. Ask questions, share your feelings, because if you're living a projection, then you're not in the same reality as the one you think you are. And if everyone's doing it, which by default we are, then our realities, even though we think we have overlapping realities, we don't. We're each going our separate way. And the, the longer anyone goes without open and honest communication, even if they love each other, even if they're well-connected, even if they talk all the time, if they don't check in with each other and make sure their realities, their perceptions of overreality re overlap, then they're going to eventually hit roadblocks and they may not be capable of dealing with them until it's too late. And that's one of the other lessons that I've, I've learned and love sharing the concept between subjective and objective reality. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I mean, I would say that the most important relationship in anyone's life is with themselves. hundred percent. I had, I, I had some things I knew about myself, which was that hierarchical poly wasn't going to work for me. Um, particularly if I wasn't the top of the hierarchy. Mm -hmm. and Those are very different things. I mean, hierarchical poly may may work for you in some contexts but it may not in others i guess it depends what i'm hearing in this brief time that that short statement to actually express that if you are going to be in a romantic if your heart's going to be involved it sounds like you want to be the most important person you want to be the first priority P potentially yeah i think that i think that i do um i would like to have at least one partner in my constellation um, that that's true for. But the thing I wanted to get to by admitting that is that even though I knew that about myself, I tried to become somebody else in order to preserve what I saw as good about the relationship. And I think mm -hmm. the minute that we start cutting off any piece of who we are in order to maintain the relationship, we've actually lost the relationship because we're no longer us. I think that the thought underlying that is absolutely correct. I don't think you've necessarily lost the relationship necessarily. Uh, very, very few relationships are unsalvageable in some way or another, and that's another conversation. But I think if you don't have the authenticity of understanding and being true to yourselves, particularly your needs and also your wants, then you're right, you do need to focus on yourself first. So if you're not in a good place with yourself, you shouldn't be looking to somebody else to fix you because A, that's not fair to them, and B, that just leads to dysfunctional uh, codependency. Yeah. The thing that didn't work for me about hierarchical was that I didn't have autonomy. Someone mm, well, else why, do you think, why is that? someone else got to decide whether we were having sex or not and how often we saw each other. Um, when is that not the case? Say again? Like, you're, you're, I, I, I'm hearing different things, so I'm actually really curious by this, if it's okay to, to ask you questions. Um, Great. <laughs> because when you, um, you know, you, you're never, even if you're in a relationship, you're never entitled to someone's sexuality, right? You're never entitled to anything. So what makes you think that, having a hierarchical or non-hierarchical relationship means that anyone else gets to decide your sexuality. Well, um, some couples like to do it the way their agreements are, is that the primary partner gets to decide when, in my case, the my man's primary partner got to decide when he saw me or hmm. not. And were there things that I maybe could have done to change that? Maybe. Um, I feel like I tried a lot of things. Um, it just what it just didn't it just we weren't able to work it out. Which it yeah. sounds like there's a conflict between your primary partner, what that person wanted and what you wanted. And I'm wondering whether there could have been some healthier way to work it out rather than competing. Uh, there definitely was, but we could we could I'm I would love to point fingers, but I won't. I'll just say that we couldn't find it. Fair enough. 
Um, <laughs> and if that's the kind of relationship that you're happy with, I mean, it, the, the resolution turned out to be unhappy uh, for you. And I don't know if that's why you're idealizing primary relationships as having the right to control their partner. Um, I would I would posit that any healthy relationship doesn't give anyone the right to control anyone else. The healthiest relationships are where people are in alignment with what they want and need. And they're in relationship with each other because they want to be, not because they're trapped into it. And that includes the decisions that they each make. Like, for example, I am fine with non-hierarchical, but I also like what a hierarchical primacy brings to my relationship. Like, as of right now, I have uh, one primary partner, um, and I have had multiple in the past, and that's a whole other ball of wax. That's complicated as heck. Yeah. Can I say heck? I'm going to say heck. It's complicated as fuck. But um, having a single primary gives me a lot of the things that most people, not just you or me, but I think most people really like, which includes having someone to trust, just feeling the, the, the safety that someone is there for you, is looking out for you, that at the end of a long day, you know there'll be somebody there. You don't need to fight for somebody else's attention. Um, you know that that person is your lifeline in many ways to safety and stability. Now, that's just the way that I do my primary relationship. People with that hierarchy don't necessarily not have that. I like the idea of polyamory because it doesn't require any structure at all. It just allows people to kind of choose their own adventure rather than, as I say, follow the, the relationship Bible. And when you can choose the, the terms of your relationship, instead of having rules, you have agreements that you decide work for you as well as for the other people in the relationship. And when you can customize a relationship, then you don't have situations that could make you feel restricted because you don't have to ever agree to something that you think is too restrictive. If you have a partnership and your partner says, okay, it's important to me that I can tell you who you can and can't date, then I would not be comfortable with that. And I would say so. And I would, if it turns out that that is the deal breaker for both of us, finding that out sooner rather than later, you know, might hurt in the short term, but it would actually be better for both of us since we wouldn't be stuck in a relationship that we both expect to be primary, but in fact wouldn't work for us and would only cause problems and waste months, years, decades of our life because there's this major incompatibility that would ultimately make one or both of us really unhappy. Yeah, absolutely. And I don't want to give the wrong impression. We had a great run. And then when it was over, it's actually freed me up to a whole, like it was time. And, mm -hmm. and I don't regret that it ended the way that it ended. Um, it's really all about knowing yourself and knowing what your partner wants and being willing to have everything on the table. Uh, I, uh, those are the most successful relationships that I see that you're actually willing to be vulnerable enough to say what works for you and what doesn't, and then to find how you can find the win-win for everybody. That's why I really like looking for friends first and foremost, because I've never had a healthy, I shouldn't say that I've never had a long-term happy, positive relationship that didn't have at its core a friendship. And I really like the idea of developing friendships with different people. And if it turns out that we're mutually attracted as athletes, we can play sports together. If we're mutually attracted to each other physically, we can have sex together. If we're affectionately and tactilely connected, we can cuddle without necessarily doing more or give each other hugs. I mean, the idea that as I mentioned earlier, sex is truly a red herring. And the idea that sex puts a relationship automatically into this other magic category is really counterproductive. I think um, developing meaningful, close friendships with people opens you up and develops the vulnerability that you'll each need to take the relationship wherever it naturally goes. Yeah. So I, in monogamy, there's kind of this escalator that we all know about, right? You step on the thing, and then you're going out for three months, then you become exclusive, then a year later you get engaged, then you get married, and you try to make it work forever. How do you avoid the escalator and it just being multiple escalators in poly? Well, I think, 
I like the idea. I used to call it the relationship ladder, but I realize the escalator is way more appropriate. Um, even though it may be harder to get off, uh, because the escalator continually pushes you forward, just like society does, just like your friends and family, like all, all your elderly relatives are like, oh, when are you getting married? You know, every time you go on a date, they're like, so how'd your date go? Yeah. Is this person the right one for you? Or if they think that they're not the right one for you, they'll tell you, be like, this person's only wasting your time. You're like my old Jewish lady accent. That's, that's, uh -huh. that's, me, that's me doing my mother. I was raised in Brooklyn. What? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I got it too. A nice Jewish boy. I ended up marrying two that weren't. <laughs> funny. Um, yeah. So the, the idea of the escalator is that if you're not, like I said earlier, if you're not dating somebody with whom you can die happily married after 70 some odd years, then you're wasting your time and their time. And I think the recognition that relationships don't need to follow any preset course or shape kind of ameliorates that. Maybe not the pressure you have from others, but I think it actually, well, actually it does because I think polyamory has contributed towards teaching me that I have the power to choose my own relationships and I don't need to be a slave to anyone else's ideas, whether it's others that have been drilled into me through socialization over the years or any relative or friend that is quite confident that they have the secret to my happiness. And while a lot of people who don't have my confidence and my experience are very easily swayed, um, and very often the people giving advice are doing so with an open heart because they genuinely think it's what's best for you, I think people would be much better off gaining experience, absorbing advice from everyone possible, but only following through on things that make sense. And that's one of the building blocks of learning how to relate in a healthy way, um, learning when and how to absorb advice. And uh, it's funny, I, I should just, I'm editing this chapter right now. I'm Okay, so I don't know if you knew this or if I mentioned this, but I'm writing a book uh, mm -hmm. on, on relationships, not necessarily for poly people, but for people of all shape, sizes, orientations, <laughs> designed to teach and share the lessons that I've learned over almost 15 years now of polyamory and being very ad, uh, very active as an advocate uh, and living the life, sharing what I've learned from literally hundreds of relationships and, and thousands of relationships that I've learned from other people in the community. I just want to share everything that I've learned with regular people so they can hopefully have healthier relationships themselves. And that's the section that I was actually just editing, um, understanding when and how to take advice. Cool. Uh, is there a place people can follow you so that it can know when the book is ready? Um, yes. I'm, uh, I would actually suggest a few things. One, I have a YouTube channel where, as you mentioned, I, I do a very, very infrequent uh, quickies in bed segment where I'm usually here, actually. <laughs> talk to the camera just like this. Uh, each segment is two minutes or or under, and it talks about basically whatever's on my mind. It's not like an interview or anything. It's just me thinking about basically freestyling about whatever's on my mind, or maybe I've written a short article that I feel like sharing. I haven't done one lately, but I, I should. Um, Ooh, we, have, we have a question actually. Oh so, yeah. So, okay. Yes. Look up. So look, find Leon's channel. But here, here's the question. Can either of us give advice on the best way to get started in poly? Would you like me to take that? Sure. Yeah. Uh, the best way is always to figure out what matters to you. Um, why did you ask the question? Like, what is important to you? Are you interested in more sex? Are you interested in sex? Are you interested in variety? I mean, these are all completely valid motivations, but I think most people just kind of go into things blindly. Uh, it's perfectly valid to just one experience be like, well, I haven't done this before and it sounds sexy. It sounds exciting. It sounds interesting. I would figure out what needs you have and how you think polyamory might meet those. So going in with a plan is a really good start. Um, but the first step is always figuring out what you need and, and why, why is super, super important. You may think, well, you know, uh, I don't want to feel restricted. Okay, that's good. Uh, so you like the idea that polyamory can give you multiple partners. Okay, but why? Why don't you feel restricted? It's a very different approach if you've had a very 
uh, clingy partner in the past who wouldn't let you do anything. Uh, and it's also very different if you grew up with a very strict set of parents or guardians who didn't let you do anything. Similar ideas, similar needs, but very different motivations. Uh, and it could also be that maybe you just like the idea of not being restricted because you like the freedom of having multiple partners. It could also be the freedom of not having anyone tell you what to do while still getting the things that you want, like sex or love or intimacy. So I think if you boil everything down and ask why, okay, yeah, but why, you'll get to a core emotion rather than a core situation or a core belief. And if you can say, okay, so the reason that I'm most interested in changing the lifestyle I have right now is curiosity or fear or loneliness. I think that will help you dictate where you look next, with whom you connect, and the kind of relationships you want to develop. Because to me, polyamory is simply acknowledging that monogamy doesn't need to work for everyone. It's like I said, a choose your own adventure. And if you know the kind of adventure you like to have, it becomes a lot easier to go to a place you'd want to go. Cool. I'm going to chime in on that one as well, because for me, it's not so much the why as it is the what. Like, what is it that you want to create in your life? I want to live in the constant awareness of love and um, expressed however, and also the possibility of sensual expression with, with whoever. Um, in a way that is constantly generating and creating more. So as long as our relationship is fun for both of us and creating more, I wanna be there with the freedom to move around. Um, and I think it's really important that you are upfront right away. People often ask me, what date do you tell people that you're poly? And I'm like, right away, it should be in your profile. Don't waste your time trying to be somebody that you're not because you're gonna attract a monogamous partner. Um, so be willing to ask for what you want um, in relationship. So I think those are those are very good points. Yeah. Uh, cool, awesome. I'm seeing how how we doing. Okay, well we we've, we've covered a lot of things. Are there? I think also that our, that Aaron might be asking for some resources. I know that there are some really some books. Um, are there things that you might would recommend that? people can use to learn more and that will help them identify who they are as a poly person. I'm actually chuckling just like I'm chuckling uh, a few minutes ago when you asked me how people can connect me or, or, or whatever. The easy way to connect to me is through my name, uh, Leon Feingold. You wouldn't think would be that unusual, but apparently I am literally the only Leon Feingold on social media. There is no other Facebook, Instagram. There is no other Leon Feingold anywhere on the planet. Um, there was a senator from Wisconsin named Russ Feingold, yep. and his father was named Leon. So if you Google, there's some stuff about another lawyer named Leon Feingold. But for the most part, but he passed away many, many years ago, and apparently nobody took up the mantle, so it's just me. And my, so father, can, had, my father had a first cousin named Leon Feingold. Oh, uh, I'm assuming he's not on Facebook. Um, not under that name. Okay. Um, so the reason I'm chuckling is because um, I, with a couple of other people, co-founded a website called Poly Quality. Um, just poly, the word poly, and then quality.com. Um, of course, play on words, but what would you expect, Mensa? Hmm. Um, the reason I'm chuckling is because it's down right now. I'm working with um, somebody that we took it down yesterday, and we're updating it, and it hosts our advice column. Uh, I co-author an advice column called Poly Wanna Answer, and it's been around for almost 10 years now. So we have a lot of really good um, advice saved up that you can check out. Wow, very nicely done. I'm impressed. Isn't that sexy? <laughs> I am such a nerd that like things like this get me <laughs> my body lit up. <laughs> wow, you know what? You're in the right place then. Um, yeah, polyquality.com, that, that is it. Um, for style purposes, I capitalized poly just to make it more obvious. But um, yeah, so we have a website, we have the advice column, and we have um, uh, a Q and A session there too. So, um, so that's a good way to reach out to us. There's also a lot of other resources online. I co-founded an organization called Open Love NY, and 
when it's not busy being a pandemic, we have events in New York several times a year, uh, several times a month, including like a poly movie night, a poly discussion group, a poly uh, night out at a bar. And depending on where you live, wherever you are watching this, um, there are almost certainly going to be some in-person events scheduled again, you know, excluding pandemic time. Um, but even now, there are lots of online resources. Open Love NY does have a pretty active Facebook page. And if you're not comfortable for whatever reason on Facebook, they have a Google group. Um, Mensa has uh, a polyamory SIG, a special interest group. Um, there's plenty of resources to be had. Um, Polyquality does maintain a list of uh, some of those links. And as soon as we're back up again, which should be within a week, um, we will have some of those there too. So if that intrigues you, by all means, check it out. And if you want to send me a message, I'm always, I can't add more people on Facebook because I, I hit the friend limit years ago, but you can find me on either Instagram or Facebook and just send me a message. Always happy to answer questions or provide any advice if I can. Awesome. Well, it's been fantastic. I could probably talk to you for hours. Um, so thank you so much for, for coming to bed with me and I enjoyed it and would like to do it again sometime. Anytime. So, uh, all right, everybody, tune in. Um, in two weeks, my guest will be Ginger Zimmerman, who is um, my my new intern, actually, at Pleasure Evolution. And she's been writing for the blog and um, particularly interested in queer studies. So we're going to be having a conversation about gender and gender equality and probably a little kinky talk as well. Um, Yes, yes. The first time we met, one of us was holding the whip. Not going to say who, but I guess you bet you can guess. Uh, <laughs> so um, these appear semi-monthly on YouTube. You can join our YouTube channel, Pleasure Evolution TV, the Facebook group, which is called Pleasure Evolution. Um, and if you've enjoyed it, please share it because, uh, you know, I'm passionate about turning on the world and having people step into their authentic sexuality as a place of power. And so the more people we got watching the stuff, uh, the more fun we can have. So thanks wow. for joining. I send Leon off into dreamland. No, no, on the contrary. It's about time I got up. I've been in bed. I've been in bed <laughs> since, uh, since this morning waiting to, uh, to talk to you. So uh, Awesome. All right. Well, then I send you off. And everybody, thanks for joining us. Until I see you again, do what gets your panties wet. Bye-bye. Take care.